So everyone, thank you for joining. And um, I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to be talking about cybersecurity as a career. I'm going to start with my journey. And from there, uh, we will go on to what's it like, what I actually do in cybersecurity. And it isn't hacking, funnily enough. Okay. So what's my journey? The journey is after school. Okay. In school, I took commerce. And uh, what happened was I took commerce. I always had an interest in science, but our system isn't exactly geared for someone. I have a disability specifically that I'm blind. So it isn't exactly geared for someone who is blind to take science. So I could spend my entire life fighting the system or I could do commerce instead. So I took commerce, I did science my own way. What also happened was, uh, I believe we have some people in eighth. Now at the end of eighth class, I got a computer and I started programming. I'm a self-taught programmer. So, and I started using the programs I was writing to help me with some of my math and also as a tool to understand math, you know, in ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th and so on. So anyhow, I took commerce, uh, then I went into B school, okay? After the cat took the MBA, you know, joined, uh, I still wanted to do IT. I said I'll do an MBA in IT because I have such an interest in technology. But that's around the early 2000s. And we had the IT slump. So no one took uh, IT as a specialization. So we just had a few subjects. So then I took up. What I had to do was I had to change my plans and I took a mix. So I took as many technology subjects as I could. But, uh, so I took a mix, HR, banking, marketing, and IT. Then I moved into education. I got an off-campus offer, took it, did a whole gamut of things, right from counseling to teaching. No, no technology. I, I wasn't teaching technology. I was teaching English. Okay, vocabulary and that kind of stuff. But I still wanted to program. So I moved into programming. Then I realized that uh, programming for somebody else isn't too much fun. What I do now, what I do with myself. So which is when a friend introduced me to the head of, uh, at that time called the Mahindra Special Services Group, that was a, it is in fact, a boutique consulting company. So I was able to leverage my technology skills and I joined, they were a startup at that point of time. And see the unique thing about information security is that it is one of the few careers that you can come into from any background. That is true today also, though what has happened is as the field has matured, you have a uh, hiring that has become more streamlined and uniform. Okay. And I'll be talking about that subsequently. So what happens is, I started consulting, which is when I suddenly realized that, oh, all right, uh, security isn't about hacking at all. Out, what am I doing? But I went, I did a lot of compliance work. I worked a lot with standards. 
I did some technology. I used my programming skills, uh, built visitor, managed, uh, visitor management systems, um, did a lot of risk management, and a boatload of other stuff. But then I had a desire that I said, okay, let's move uh, to some place. I want to see what's at the top of the industry. I want to go to the best. I want to see an evolved place with infrastructure. So I moved to industry. I, took, I got a taste of industry. And now I'm back to consulting. Will I go back to industry? I don't know. Uh, the, these things vary uh, from time to time. And I'll be talking about what are the advantages, disadvantages that I have found in both places. So that's been roughly the career journey in the sense that, okay, it, it's a non-traditional way of entering security. How people enter cybersecurity typically is you start typically from a help desk or networking role, like an IT administrator. And then you start growing, you become a SOC analyst. By SOC, I mean a security operations center. And then you move further up. So I'm going to talk more about all of these things. But before I do that, I need to first define what is cyber security because the usual view of cyber security is protecting against hackers. That is largely true, but there are three pillars of cyber security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is what is the pillar that we are familiar with. You know, it is keeping secrets. Uh, anyone played Chinese whispers? That that's what you do in confidentiality. Aha. Integrity is something we don't talk about too much, but it is essentially making sure that data is accessible to the right person at the right time. So for example, if you're a school, and for whatever reason, you have medical records of a student and they are protected. And suddenly you have the student falling sick, you know, going to the medical room. Any of us uh, done this, I suppose, at some point of time? You go in and the doctor needs to access those records and we suddenly find that, oh, well, they're securely stored, they're encrypted in three layers, but uh, getting them will take 40 minutes. That's not security. And that isn't security because you don't have them available at the right time. And that creates a challenge, okay? The third piece is availability. Now, what I mean by availability is that, okay, wait, I'm mixing up definitions here. What I told you now was availability, okay? Confidentiality, availability is what I told you. Integrity means data should not be modified, okay? So for example, staying with our medical records analogy, if you have, blood group stored, then it's only the doctor who should be able to change the blood group, okay? You can't have, let's say, uh, an administrator or perhaps even the principal changing a blood group. Why? Because who has the authority to change blood groups? And how do you design these systems to maintain the authority? That is the kind of thing we look at in integrity. In addition, we also look at things like logging. Who has changed what? So security rests on these three pillars, okay? Confidentiality, integrity, availability. 
confidential confidentiality is keeping secrets integrity is ensuring that the data remains untampered and also that it can be modified only by authorized individuals and availability is making sure that data can be given to whom who needs it at the right time okay and it also involves taking backups and elements of business continuity so this is security now what you're going to realize is this actually covers a huge gamut of things because suddenly you realize that it's not only the keeping of secrets remember one thing security is a business enabler okay which means that our job is not to lock everything down as a security professional our job is to ensure that data is protected but also that it can be used and consumed safely within established parameters now so this is something you you need to be cognizant of all the time every time okay in fact if you try locking things down too much you'll probably be fired as a security professional because the data is collected it's meant to be used because after all data for any organization in any context or for an individual is an asset okay so what is my day like okay as a security professional what do i do now that depends on my role but usually if i am let's say in a company or in an industry i will first first thing in the morning i am going to be scanning dashboards okay now by a dashboard what i mean is i'm going to have a graphical view of how my security systems are doing has there been an attack are my systems performing or whatever other metric my i have defined or my organization has defined i need to do this because i have to make sure that my systems are functioning okay that that's the biggest thing for me are they working and are they doing what they are supposed to be doing that is my first question the second thing is in the event that it is not or there is a crisis then you dive straight into that crisis because in security the trouble with the crisis is it can escalate very 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 quickly you know it's like uh almost having think of it this way okay suppose you're in the army you're facing the enemy you are having 40000 bullets flung at you every second okay what i mean by this is typically in security if you're looking if you're looking at a network and it's a large network a large organization you are talking about almost 40 to 50000 events maybe more 60000 alerts and events that you're looking at at one shot you got to make sense of it okay a lot of it is routine traffic some of it would be attacker traffic or potential attacker traffic okay 
so i do that then i have some time for new initiatives and after that i ensure that at least for 15 to 30 minutes in a day i spend time updating myself i need to know the latest attacks i need to know attack trends whatever this is an industry in consulting depending on how i am deployed where i am deployed so let's say you get into a big firm like ey or you know kpmg pwcs it all depends on what your client role is so in the event that you are on a project you're going to spend a lot of time in meetings and and that's how your day will start it's crucial for you in consulting to stay updated and ideally if you can make sure you get that update first thing so that when you are talking to a client you have the latest info with you or at least you know where to look for it okay you start with that now in the event that as a you are deployed on a project which involves you supervising security operations or tools or something then of course you'll check those first okay all right now one of the things i also do if i am a manager is look at cvs Now, this is where i was telling you information security is one of the most unique fields that we have so far so you know some of you may have made a cv uh if you haven't you will be making them and what we are interested in is in showing you know in seeing what is your passion is security a passion how do you stay updated what is the work that you have done okay so the faster you get into projects you volunteer for example at a non profit or maybe with a company if you are, if you can do that and and help secure them the better the cv is i may see a top end degree full marks every kind of certification i may not hire that person because it's all that tells me is that you are good at taking exams great you may be good as a, as a security professional also i am not saying that excludes you but in security because it's so dynamic i need you to think fast i need you to have your own system of learning now one of the things that uh, often comes up as a criticism is well okay you want us to learn you know if you look at security job descriptions but we don't have tool experience how do we do that because remember in security for everything you have a different tool and up to you whether to use the tool not to use the tool that doesn't matter you have open source tools you have closed source tools whole gamut of things so the, the thing you've got to remember is work with as much as you can okay a lot of closed source tools are commercial so it will be very expensive for you to work with those tools but with open source all you have to do is learn how to configure those tools which teaches you a lot about it and how the systems work and then do security 
so what is the mindset okay is the mindset is intense curiosity why is something like this i need to see if something is behaving in a particular way the most frequent question you should be asking is why and once you've got a why also look at the how and in some cases the who but asking why is one thing okay that's crucial the other thing you've got to remember is you have to be very very calm because you're going to be hit by a lot of situations and then the situations move very quickly by very quickly i mean they move they can move within minutes so what i mean by this for example i am seeing an attack on my systems someone is flooding me with packets okay with data it's a normal flood it's okay i'll block him or i can manage it. it's fine but after 20 minutes suddenly the scale shoots up and then i'm knocked offline now what do i do so uh those of you and anyone ridden a bicycle here it's like riding a bike okay you need to have relaxed awareness you need to be aware of what's going on and you have to react you cannot be in a state of constant tension because that is unsustainable humanly unsustainable so we were talking about entering the field and i already told you you know is there a degree versus experience and they go hand in hand it's not a degree versus experience you can enter cybersec with no security experience but you've got to have the basic knowledge in place because it's a bit like chemical engineering you know where you've got to know basic chemistry before you can do anything with chemicals you may not know you know specifics of let's uh, of something in chemistry you know for example polymers you may not know that but as long as you know basic chemistry you will be able to understand how polymers are made that's the thing even with security now there are several ways to enter the field which we have already covered in you know when we talked about cvs the basis is still going to be your experience and project work whether you volunteer you get hired or you spend some time at help desk now the help desk in an organization is where all the problems come in and that is where you really learn the fundamentals of computers and technology and so the stronger your knowledge of system fundamentals the easier it is for you to troubleshoot security related issues see the mindset can be taught what cannot so the technology can be taught but the mindset has to be developed over a period of time okay so you know i've been talking a lot about getting experience volunteering etc etc what do you actually do okay you focus on networking and operating systems first okay networking because you got to understand how data is flowing operating systems because 
they are the core above which everything else is built. So focus on Linux, focus on FreeBSD, understand how Macs work, even look at Windows. It doesn't matter. But understand how these things work. Once you do that, you then can set up a series of virtual machines to simulate a home lab. This starting a lab is absolutely critical because you need to practice. And for that, uh, what you then have to do is you have a bunch of virtual machines, you set up networking between them and then start testing. So for example, you have distributions of Linux like Kali Linux, that's K-L-I. And something like Kali is already set up with a lot of security tools which you can play with. Do not try to hack somebody else's system without permission. That is a crime in most jurisdictions. Those days, you know, when hackers were these idealistic people and saying that, okay, hey, we just wanted to outshine our buddy and do more and learn more, those are gone. Okay. There may be a few, but those days are gone. Mostly hacking happens for monetary reasons, information reasons, somebody wanting to steal some information. And it also happens for theft, right? That, that is information. You have money and, and that's primarily it. Okay. Those are the two reasons. Showing off bragging rights very occasionally. Maybe a few percentage points of hacking will happen because of that. So don't hack somebody's system. What you can do, however, is look at what are called bug bounty programs. And these are programs that many companies start to let attackers find vulnerabilities in their code. So make sure you understand what are the boundaries of the particular program you choose and then go for it. So typically by the time you're in college, let's say we're all in, most of us are in school, right? So we start working on the labs, we work, uh, understand operating systems. So by the time you're out of college, you're going to have a fair amount of experience. And show us published projects. Okay. And by published, I mean, it's not necessarily that has to be programming. It can also be things like uh, writing. You can write blog posts on what you discover. And security writing is like any other writing. You develop your own unique voice. So though there are several thousand blogs and you'll be one amongst them, that doesn't matter because your writing style would be unique. The way you explain things would be unique. And that's important. Now, I've had over the years, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to program. And um, so I got into security. You don't have to be a programmer to be in security. But programming is a tool which is going to help you. So it's important to have that skill. Okay. And I don't care which language you learn. It doesn't matter. HTML, by the way, is not a language. It's a presentation uh, language based on XML. But 
learn about learn whether you learn C++, you learn Java, you want to pick up .NET, Python, doesn't matter. Pick any language. Learn it. Okay. Now, for a second, I'm going to step away. What happens is, uh, I'm going to talk to the teachers here. There aren't too many parents, but all the same schools and teachers. The main thing for you is to create a safe space for your students to explore, give them the labs, let them experiment with the computers internally on a, on a safe network. Let them play, let them try to break into machines, let them write, let them publish. Don't hold them back. And encourage them to try and also do your best to get resources to get their questions answered. So whether it is calling in industry participants, whether it's, um, you know, buying books, for example. Books are a very crucial element of cybersecurity because everything is not covered in a blog post. You have to read the books first if you really want to grow and understand. Okay. So, the main thing for you is to explore with your students. And that is what will make the journey fun. I'm going to dive a little deeper into labs for a minute. So one of the questions that we get asked when we say build labs is what tools? I already mentioned one, which is Kali Linux. You also have to use a network sniffer such as Wireshark, which tells you, which will show you how packets flow across a network. And that is something you should be able to understand. You also have to understand something called a port scanner, something like an Nmap, because that will tell you what is exposed on a given system. Okay. And once that is done and you decide that, okay, I'm going to attack this today, or this is a weak system on my own network that I want to attack then you need to figure out what is running on that system. See, how do hacks happen? I'm guessing this is the section everyone's waiting for. But at a very high level, a hack will happen. Somebody will scan a system. You will determine what are the possible points of interface. And then you will look for weaknesses and exploit those weaknesses. And then you cover your tracks after you exploited the weakness. But then that, that is the typical high level root of a hack. So this exploration of weaknesses has to happen when you're learning on a safe network. And that is a critical thing schools, teachers, as well as parents can do give the space to explore. Okay. Now we spend a lot of time on hacking, but that is not the only thing that you do in cybersecurity. Today, uh, there are a lot of audits, which is making sure that the systems that have been put in place conform to certain norms. That's your compliance. Because a lot of governments have put up frameworks and in case the organization you're with is subjected to those frameworks, then you're bound to 
implement those frameworks and ensure that they are externally validated correctly. So you have an audit function. Governance is ensuring all of this plus, in, you know, you're dealing with, you know, you, you have a lot of systems coming into any company for security. You also have cloud and so on. So you deal with contracts. You also deal with things called service level agreements to make sure that if you have made an agreement with somebody to provide a specific service at a given point of time, then that service is actually given. And these are called service level agreements or SLAs, which you will deal with much later in life. But as a manager in cybersecurity, they are extremely important. However, however, you still need your security fundamentals because you need to know how things work. Now, mind you, today's industry, you can get away with not understanding fundamentals. As long as you can convince the other person that, hey, you know what you're talking about. The problem with that, and I don't suggest you do that even for a minute, is you enter, you start working, you fall on your face because you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what the other person is doing. So that is why don't do this. Learn the basics. Okay. Now, how do you stay, you know, how do you keep track of all this management, cybersecurity, career? The main thing is you have to stay updated. And the only help for that is to read, read, and read more. Whether it's blogs, whether it's whether it's journals, whether it's publications, whatever else. You have to learn and stay updated with those blogs. Why? Because security changes quickly. The attacker will not wait for you to learn. He'll exploit that weakness and attack. Okay. The other key skill you need to have is conflict management. You're going to be doing a lot of fighting, a lot of convincing in any role, whether it's consulting, where you're advising a client and getting a project implemented, whether it's industry, you're a manager trying to convince your boss to do something or convince somebody lower down to adopt a security measure. You're going to be doing a lot of that. You have to stay calm. No point in panicking. Because if you panic, you make, you make bad decisions and that can lead to a loss. That loss can also be monetary, not only data. Okay. And a very, very, very critical skill is communication and writing. You have to have this key skill because at whatever stage you are at in this profession, you're going to be communicating either with your peers, people below you, your managers, the board of the company, whatever else or whoever else. And you're a, you need to have the ability to articulate. Kind of hi, uh, I think I have to come in for a second. I think we lost your audio. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Uh, did you get till the word articulate? I would, I would prefer people uh, confirming it on. So you can actually continue. The blip was only for a couple of seconds. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So articulating of ideas is the key. 
I am not asking you to have the Queen's English, but I expect if you have a computer science degree, or if you come in and tell me that I want to volunteer, you at least spell check your documents, write grammatically correct sentences, so that in one reading I can understand what you're saying. Okay. And that's the important part in security. So setting up the lab, all of that, yes, important. But reading and articulating ideas and your own thoughts is as important. Okay. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about industry in the sense, what are the kinds of roles you've got? Well, what actually happened? Because I've thrown around some terms. Let me clarify those. You know, I told you that at the beginning, you come in as an entry level, as an analyst, a SOC analyst. First, you've got to understand what is the security operations center. A security operations center as a unit, is a unit in a firm. Now this can be anything, whether it's your school, whether it's Amazon, Flipkart, whatever else, whichever other company, it's basically a unit which tracks the entire landscape of IT and the organization and has data coming to it from all systems. And it checks the behavior of this data and then determines if there is an attack. So by data, I don't mean what the systems are doing. I mean, logs. See your computers today. Also, they keep a diary of what has been done. So you install something on the machine. It'll actually log it. So those logs are what are captured in a security operations center. And those are analyzed to check for behavioral deviation. That's when you really learn about assets and how a network is working. So from there, you typically grow to manage the SOC and a typical SOC size, depending on the company size is large companies, whatever, 30 to 40 people, maybe even 60 people for really large setups. Otherwise, it can be homegrown anywhere between three to 15 people, three to 10 people, depends. So you've got the SOC analyst, you've got the SOC manager, then you'll become a security manager where your role is similar, uh, but you're going to be involved more in new initiatives and also in change management. The change management is suppose you're updating a tool with a new patch or you are putting a new proxy server. You've got to be able to uh, deal with that change, evaluate it to make sure that it doesn't compromise security and then approve that change. As you grow up, you're going to be also be looking at contracts. You're going to be doing a lot of recruitment and you're going to also uh, be making a lot of presentations to non-technical people, which is a plus in a way, because, you know, if you enjoy teaching, uh, that's great. But sometimes it does become difficult because certain concepts are a little hard to translate. Okay. At all the, and finally you become a chief information security officer in an industry who is basically the person who is overall in charge. He is responsible. So if there's any kind of breach, his head is on the chopping block. If you're in consulting, you become a partner where you, of course, do client support, uh, but your job is also to bring in business and generate revenue for the firm by selling cybersecurity services. Hello. 
irrespective of your role you know i've been talking about thinking and critical thinking and organizing your thoughts once again i'm stressing you need to have critical thinking okay uh, i don't know how we for time let's say from uh, a 30 to 35 minute status how are we uh it's it's almost 6 now so uh, how much time more time would you are need before we start the q and a oh uh that's good actually because i would need another 5 to 10 minutes maybe i think sounds perfect okay great so one of the things you'll notice as you go up the line is exams i know all of us love exams don't we so what happens is you have something called industry certifications so basically what happens with the industry certification is to acquire a certain subsection of knowledge a lot of companies and industry bodies have come up with a set of course material and you take an exam at the end of it and you get a certificate proving that yeah you have taken this exam and you are qualified what happens is uh, they because it's an industry certification you have to keep renewing them that's one or otherwise you have to show industry that you have continued your professional development and your learning so that is something that is important to have now there is always this conflict in industry should you have certification should you not what should you do so for example a certification is cissp okay certified information system security professional or you have a standard called the iso 27001 that has a lead auditor and a lead implementer certification you have you want to do audits you have a cisa certification cisa or uh, you have a comp tia you have ethical hacking certifications and so on now the thing with the certification is if you enter from an unrelated field they help you bridge your knowledge gap for example the cissp helped me do that it also helps you if you mention this on your cv human resources professionals will find you using keywords so that's important if you have been able to demonstrate that you applied your certification that is absolutely super okay so how apply let's say you did the cissp and then if you tell me that okay i did my cissp and after that i implemented this project on user access management okay great and then i'll ask you questions about the project to gauge how much security you actually know or what you did and so on so you should have certifications don't get too many but decide you know basing or uh, based on what you decide to do you should acquire a few certifications don't do them now because a lot of them require need work experience so that's not going to help you too much if you want to work show me the work okay rather than doing certification all right where is cyber security going a lot of manual tasks you know like uh, some part of soc analysis and so on is actually being done by machines 
the organization's perimeter see earlier it was just the data center today it's all moved to the cloud and those of you who are using facebook dropbox whatever else it's moved the point is security is also moved with that stuff now you have a lot of virtualization and because people try to predict attacker behavior as well as deviations from what user behavior uh, behavior uh, is takes place they do try to use things like machine learning machine learning because it has the ability to predict what can be in a given set of data okay that's the only reason why that's been used uh, a lot of people throw about very loose terms like robotics uh, someone will tell you hey, i made a, i built a bot uh, you built a bot basically they've just done some automation and built a program to deal with that okay so you have to dig a little deeper and ask in fact in a lot of cases journalists make very good security professionals because they're curious and they dig also you know on an informal side note i can tell you read detective stories that also helps because it it helps you crystallize your curiosity okay so learn the machines start with your basics in terms of technology agnostic technologies don't go straight away learn amazon because if you just learn amazon or the microsoft azure or whatever else it, that's a vendor dependent cloud and you'll tell me that okay i know these okay great you know it but then what so that is something you have to keep in mind okay and you have to know how the machines are thinking because tomorrow if you have let's say a data leak prevention system which blocks the ceo's email he'll want you to explain that decision as a security professional and you have to be able to do that at that point of time so that's uh, pretty much what i had except that what i want to tell you is the you know till today the advantage in security has been with the attacker because the attacker has to get it right just once however today if we pick up our data the traffic logs the system logs and analyze them correctly we can swing the advantage towards the defender okay and finally the other thing that's coming more and more into security is law and regulation so whether it's a privacy law whether it is you know the it law which has clauses on security you have to keep track of that because to grow you need to understand the law you will be the one sitting with your company's legal teams so that is why don't neglect that aspect it doesn't matter whether you like it or hate it but you have to be aware of what are the legal ramifications of data breaches what's in the sector and so on so yeah that's uh, pretty much it 604 by my watch which actually surprises me because i didn't think i would be able to talk for this long uh i don't how do you want to take it from here so got 37 odd questions with a lot of upwards uh, okay if you if you if you suggest we would like to start off with those that will be lovely right yeah okay so this is this is probably the uh, most 
voted question. Uh, so I'm reading it verbatim for you. Sir, ethical hacking is a wide spectrum of subjects. How to start or how to initiate that mind building which requires the skills of hacking at an age of say 15. Ayush, are you there? If you're there, raise your hand. Maybe I'll, I'll pass it on. Give you the speaking rights to ask this question. Ayush, if you're there, I'll give you another 10 seconds. Anyone else? Uh, okay, so uh, no, no raise. Archie is, has raised a hand. I'll probably pass on. Yeah, Archie. Please go uh, ahead. Yeah. So how, I mean, sorry, what is actually a hacking and how we can uh, uh, make a career in ethical hacking? Okay. All right. Let me demystify a few things here. Firstly, your age doesn't matter. You can be 15, you can be 150, but you're going to start the same way. You know the part where I said, build your own lab with Kali virtual box for virtualization. Uh, what I'll add is get hold of a micro board like a Raspberry Pi so that you can actually experiment with these tools and try to break into them. So for example, uh, keep a weak password in Raspberry Pi, then run Kali in a virtual box and try to break that or try to run exploits uh, from Kali to let's say another virtual machine running say Ubuntu and seeing how that works. So you will have to build that lab and start. Now, hacking is actually, the actual word means getting deep into something. So you could be repairing radios. And if you go very deep into repairing radios, that's also hacking. But to do security work, okay, what we, we don't use the term hacking all that much. Uh, we call it penetration testing because, <coughs> sorry, the idea is to gauge how strong or how resilient a system is to an attack. Okay. It doesn't matter. See, the, the skill, even if you didn't want to do ethics, okay, if you don't want to do ethics, Ethics is a mindset. That is your set of values that you have. Hacking or breaking into a system is a morality neutral skill. It's like cutting. You know, you can cut someone's neck, you can cut an apple and feed someone. The cutting skill is the same. That, that's what it is with hacking. So build your home lab with micro boards and virtual machines. Pick up a distribution of tools such as Kali Linux, or if you want to install your own tools, go ahead, do that. Grab a book. You have a lot of books on getting started with security and exploits and follow along. And that's the simplest ways. You have a lot of YouTube videos and stuff like that, but I find books better because they're more detailed. You also have, you know, for starting, uh, I think it's called Try Hack Me and a bunch of other sites that take you, uh, they give you machines to hack. So, and you have something called Capture the Flag events where in a limited period of time, you actually have to break in and get hold of a rival machine. You have all of those and you can participate in those once you build a little bit of experience. Okay, uh, I'll take some of the easier ones, uh, Pranav, if you allow. Uh, is it possible to hack a Mac? Yeah, it's as simple as that, yes. 
Sir, I want to ask something. Archie, Archie, you'll have to wait for your turn now, uh, unless it's related on the same question. Okay. Uh, just to uh, add on to this question, uh, Pranav, uh, why do people feel that it is uh, Max cannot be had? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is a perceptions game. You know, when I spoke of communication, right? This is a perceptions thing where people say Max can't be hacked. Uh, people will tell you statistical arguments that, oh, uh, Windows has a lot of worms and this and that. It's very prone. Some of it may have been true earlier. Uh, but now, you know, weaknesses are there in every system and that's a way of, that's because of the way computer engineering is done. If we build bridges this way, they would be collapsing every second day or something like that. Okay. Why do people feel it's a perception? Um, and Max are just as prone. In fact, the last assessment we were doing, uh, we had to assess Max also for weaknesses. They're there. They can be exploited just as easily. Cool. Uh, which type of websites can hack our devices? Hmm. Interesting question. A website that will hack your device is a poorly developed website where usually either some piece of the website like the backend database or the framework that renders the web page is not updated. So what has happened is that the attacker has actually exploited that website, put in some malicious code, which is then uh, gone into your device because you access that site and try to break your device. So typically it will be an unpatched website. Something is out of date. So in fact, for all of you to stay secure, make sure your Mac, PCs, whatever you've got are updated. The same applies to phones. Have to have to stay patched because a lot of patches fix security holes. They introduce some new ones also from time to time, but by and large, they fix issues. If I'm a beginner, how do I get started with ethical hacking? And uh, just, security? just answer that. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're a beginner or whatever. You want to enter security, you've got to have you have to know networking. You have to at least know how operating systems work to a fair amount level. Uh, these days, you also have to understand, depending on where you are in a career as a beginner, if you know these terms and you read a few blogs and journals about where the industry is going, that's enough. And keep track of vulnerabilities. Do a search for the common vulnerabilities database. Uh, see what breaches come up. See, one of the most important things for you as a professional, I don't care whether you're a beginner or not, but anybody who's interested in security, go beyond what is reported. So for example, you know, you had a WannaCry and people were reporting it in the media. Dig down a little bit, research. By research, I mean search rather so that you understand what lies at the heart of that weakness. How was it done? What actually happened? Is that weakness relevant to your context or not? So for example, you will read stories where some piece of software was exploited because of an older version present. Well, do you even use that software in the first place? So don't go panicking straight away. Check that. That, that is what uh, you've got to keep in mind here. Uh, so this is one, uh, reading it uh, as it is. So can you explain the do's and don'ts while writing a program so that we can prevent mistakes and make a good program? Hmm. 
So when you're asking is secure coding, uh, I'm gonna be very, very quick with this because this is a whole one hour, another hour of presentation by itself. But first things, sanitize user input because user in input can be evil. You gotta work on your exception handling. So that is errors, whatever framework the language provides, you gotta make sure you handle those correctly. You also have to make sure that you're using libraries that are known to be secure. You may not have the skills to check on the libraries, but do search in case vulnerabilities have been found and what are the fixes. Uh, use updated frameworks. So whether it's WordPress or Django, Flask, make sure you're using the latest versions of all of these. And test. Okay, test, test and do more testing uh, so that you can figure out how the I'm program sure. you're writing can be broken. Okay, in a nutshell, that's what it is. Okay. Uh, Okay, so for someone asking, uh, you know, is this a first class and can I attend more? The answer is no, sir. The intent was very different. Uh, we don't run intend to run a course on cybersecurity and ethical hacking. The idea was to help you understand uh, what it is and, and, and what probably you can do to make a career in it, right? Uh, Okay, so this is probably a little canny, uncanny, you know, uh, canny question. How can we hack the passwords without getting to know someone? <laughs> I love these questions. Uh, the short answer is you can't. It really depends on what is the system and what is the reason for you hacking a password? Typically, if you're doing this for snooping, forget it. You know, the part where I said in my presentation, don't do stuff illegally, that's where this fits into. So don't do it. Yeah, you wanna do a password audit? The answer is you grab the password store of the operating system and run a password brute forcing tool like John the Ripper or the, any number of other tools on it. You use okay. rainbow tables and uh, you see how quickly you can brute force the password. Uh, student wants to ask, I want to understand all types of hacking just for educational purpose. No. The question is unfair. What do you mean by all types? I want to understand all types of hacking uh, just for education, just it, it's basically a question is for an academic purpose. Uh, with the student wants to understand what are the different types of hacking. There is no question of types of hacking. Look, hacking is getting deep into anything. You have classified people who do hacking as black hat, gray hat, white hats. So black hats are the evil ones. Uh, gray hats are sort of in the middle and the white hats are the good people. But those are people classification. Okay. It's not about types of hacking. Let me understand, you know, if, if, if I, because this is one question that we skipped initially, not sure. Mm -hmm. It's making sense. Uh, ethical hacking is a wide spectrum of subjects. How to start, like how to initiate that mind building, which requires the skills of hacking at an age of 15. That's the question. We covered this, but yeah. you know, mind building again, it really depends on, you know, let's cover the psychology now for a change because it's on your ability to step by solve a problem and to analyze a problem. Can you break down the problem? So for example, in hacking, if you're attacking a system, what is the system that I'm attacking? 
what does the system expose do the exposed elements have any weaknesses if there are some weaknesses can i take advantage of them what does it mean if i take advantage if i take advantage will the system go down or will it stay up do i want to be detected not detected what that depends so so you have to train yourself to work step wise and uh, if you're doing math the best way to do is show the steps of your uh, problems when you solve them write down those steps in detail that that's how you build your mindset and the same applies to programming if you program you build this problem solving skill because you have to encode the problem in the way a computer thinks so that's where that skill comes in handy we will take this as a last question uh, you know uh, okay. so uh, most of these questions you know so one has asked is there a specific qualification that is required to become a ethical hacker or a cyber security expert uh, i think we have covered this a um, million times uh, in the course of this session pranav is a fantastic example you know commerce graduate management a self taught uh, coding expert uh not necessarily engineering is not is not a necessity uh this is a very skill based job and uh, what what i heard from pranav say is it is age independent so some of the finest uh you know one of the when i was in college i remember ankit fadia came into the into the world map right uh no it's there's no specific it's a very skill based area that you need to come in uh from there's a question and this is more from a curiosity mm. uh and a, a lot of kids have asked this question how do you pursue and i'm going to rephrase it uh, you know huh. how do you pursue your hobby in photography uh in spite of uh you know blindness yes <laughs> all right I use uh, a piece of software called the Voice. Uh, go to seeingwithsound. dot com. Uh, it's made by a Dutch physicist that works like an artificial eye, which translates uh, live camera views to a specific sound schema. So I use that, frame the scene, and then I take a picture. so to keep this in the security context you actually have a c implementation of the voice on seeingwithsound.com it'll be nice if someone could do a security analysis of that piece of software and let us know whether the coding is secure or is something else or is there something else that has to be done as the answer in a nutshell yep you do a uh, last question i am moving giving the speaking rights to vanshika and that's going to be the last one for today i know we have kind of far exceeded the time vanshika it's on you uh good evening sir yes uh sir i want to know that uh, if we uh, that all the websites are made from the web pages and if we are known to the html coding then we can easily program these web pages and uh, we can uh, check the codings and uh, change the uh, change these codings and uh, we can easily hack those passwords and all uh so what's the question uh can it be legal or illegal no it's illegal firstly knowledge of a web page or html will not let you hack a password so let me tell you how a website works how it works is when you type let's say www.dubdubgo.com it goes out from your machine goes to your isp a dns lookup is done the ip address is determined it goes to that server once it reaches that server the server pushes out 
the web page to you, which lands in your browser. There's no question of passwords. Yeah, you have a login and a password. So remember one thing, the login and password, unless it's really, really badly designed, is not stored on the client machine. It's always stored on the server and it's hashed. So even the system doesn't see the password. What happens is once you've entered a password, the password is hashed. It's a one way hash typically. And you enter the same password. Now your system also hashes the password. It is the hash of the password that goes in and is, that is compared. And if the two hashes match, it means it is the same password. And that's how it works. There's no question of breaking a password. You want to break a password, you have to go grab the database on the server of the application, then pull it down and then brute force it. But this is a hundred percent illegal unless the company has a bug bounty program and those are agreed terms of the bug bounty program or you have been hired to do this kind of testing under a legally binding contract. Okay, thank you, sir. Welcome. Great. Uh, I am so sorry, guys. We will not be able to take any more questions. It's 6.30 uh, by my watch and we have far exceeded what we requested uh, runner for and everyone else. Uh, I also understand for some of you, it's a it's an exam week. So uh, let's let's keep it for for now. Uh, you know you can submit your questions on my email ID. It's Mithil Arun at Outlook.com. I will try and route it through Pranav uh, and and see what you know what best we can do. The recording of today's session will be available to all of you on our YouTube channel. I would request you to, the link is there on the, on the, in the, in the chat window. Uh, we keep uploading videos there, makes sense if you can go and, and, and probably subscribe to the channel. That's absolutely voluntary. It's not, there's nothing uh, more for today. Thank you so much Pranav. I think you've been extremely, uh, Fine with your time and uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Arun. For, it's, for it's been fun. Yep. Thanks so much. I am happy you kind of enjoyed it. Thanks, everyone, and bye bye. I'm going to close the session.